You're listening to the Strangeology Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Foran, and this is your place to explore the weird, the strange and unexplained, from cryptids and creatures, the paranormal, aliens and UFOs, forbidden knowledge, ancient mysteries, conspiracies, and more. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I hope you enjoyed my last episode all about the Alaska Triangle and its myriad mysteries. It was a fun one for sure. So if you haven't checked that one out yet, make sure to go back and give it a download. Today's episode is an intense one and the first interview of the season. But before we begin, I just want to go over a couple reminders and announcements. First off, Strangeology just celebrated its third anniversary as of April 3rd, which is wild. The podcast actually didn't start until December of 2020, but it found its beginnings posting about cryptids and other weird stuff over on my Instagram account. And I decided eventually that I wanted to start a podcast because I really liked getting into topics and diving deep into all the high strangeness that's out there. And I'm continually amazed at the support that all of you out there give by listening and sharing the podcast and checking out all the other stuff that I'm putting out. So thank you for joining me and coming along for this weird ride. It's been an awesome journey so far. So here's to many more years to come. As far as festivals, just a quick reminder, if you're looking to find me at any of these upcoming cryptid, 40 and paranormal fests this year, I'm going to be at Small Town Monsters' very first Monster Fest, and that's going to be happening in Canton, Ohio on Saturday, June 3rd. Tons of my friends will be vending along with myself, of course. This event's probably going to be pretty big, so definitely make sure to come out. The only other event that I have on the books for this year is the Sasquatch Calling Festival in Whitehall, New York, which is on Saturday, September 24th in Skeensboro Park. And that's going to be an awesome time too. I did it last year and it was a lot of fun. There's tons of people. It's like this huge cryptid craft fair type thing in this park that's right along a big river. And they have a Sasquatch Calling Festival at the very end of the day. And I think there's a winner and a runner up and stuff. <laughs> it was it was pretty fun for sure. So definitely find me there. These are probably going to be my only two events that I'm going to be vending at this year. But next year in 2024, I'm going to try to hop on a few additional ones. There was a couple new ones this year. There was the Frogman Fest in Loveland. Well, it wasn't in Loveland, Ohio, but it was for the Loveland Frogman Festival that was put on by Jeff Craig from Map in Black. And maybe I'll do that one next year. It's always sketchy weather in early March when they did it. So we'll see. And there's also a new festival happening this year that's being put on by Lisa from Cryptid Comforts in Pennsylvania that's called Squonkapalooza. Of course, the the squonk from Fearsome Critters <laughs> is going to be the theme, the central theme for that one. That's happening, I think, in August in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. It's like right in the center of the state. And I'm sure that's going to be a blast. I wish I could go, but I've got a lot of family stuff happening in August. So unfortunately, that's not going to happen for me this year, but maybe next year. I was hoping to get on to Mothman Fest this year as well, but unfortunately, it looks like they already had all their vendor spots filled up. I'm not sure if that was just because of a waiting list from the past few years. So that's a bummer, but maybe next year. We'll see. And finally, I'm planning on hosting a big giveaway of Strangeology merch the day this episode drops over on my Instagram as a celebration for Strangeology turning three this year and recently hitting 150,000 downloads for the show. So thank you so much for listening. Definitely make sure to head on over there after you listen to the episode today. And who knows, maybe you'll get some sweet Strangeology merch. All right, so without further ado, I got to speak with the folks from Hellbent Holler, Jesse and Joe, and got to hear all about their investigations and the really strange stuff they've experienced in the wilderness of Southern Appalachia. And guys, this this gets wild. So strap in because this is probably the wildest 
interview I've done to date. So get ready. All right, folks, welcome back. Tonight's guests are Jesse and Joe from Hellbent Holler. And I'll give a brief intro here. Hailing from the Carolinas, Hellbent Holler is a two-person research team that investigates all manners of high strangeness in the southern Appalachians. From the forests of the land between lakes to the mountains of North Georgia, Hellbent Holler takes a tech-driven yet unconventional approach to exploring mysterious phenomena. The duo has researched Sasquatch, Dogman, anomalous lights, and all manner of wilderness paranormal activity. Hellbent Holler consists of Joe, who has spent the last two decades looking into the existence of Bigfoot in the southern states, and Jesse Lee, a longtime researcher of the paranormal and occult. The two members combine and sometimes contrast their research methods and philosophies on various phenomena to create a unique and holistic approach to their search for answers. So welcome to the show, guys. Can you tell me the origins of Hellbent Holler? Uh, What made you decide to go out there and look for cryptids and weirdness in the woods? Um, I think uh, Hellbent Holler, kind of the genesis of it was, it started way back. You know, you can always say that there's kind of an origin story. How did you get into cryptozoology? How did you get into paranormal um, research? We both had kind of different approaches and how we got into it. Uh, I was more on the paranormal side. I was really into ghost hunting and occult um, activity and stuff like that. And Joe was more into the physical cryptid aspect of it. But we both we met in New Orleans and we ended up moving back to the southern Appalachian region where we're both from. And we just decided to start getting into this research and going out and investigating. It actually started, we didn't start filming or anything. We just decided we would start legend tripping. So we listened to a podcast actually, and there was a really cool story about the shape-shifting witch. And it was on a trail that we were, we knew how to get there. We had never been there before, but it wasn't that far of a drive for us. So we drove up there. We wanted to check out this trail and see this possible shape-shifting witch. So we went up there and it's in an area called Panther Town Valley. And we went up there and just weird stuff happened from the get-go. And it was kind of a surreal experience. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a scary and surreal experience. So after that happened, we decided, okay, we need to start filming this and sharing this with people because if this is what's going on in the woods, we really need to share this with people. Yeah, and it was a pretty, we went out, like Jesse said, we went out just legend tripping. We'd heard this podcast, like she said, and it wasn't that far from us. We decided to go just see what we'll see. We were we were really deep into hiking and the outdoors at that point anyway. And like she said, we just had all of this weird stuff happen. And it was a really quiet drive for like a good hour coming back. We got in the car. Nobody really said anything. Yeah. About an hour into it, we're like, are we going to talk about what just happened? And it was, it, like she said, it was surreal is probably the best description of it. Um, and we got home and like we got up the next day and we discussed a little bit more. We'd had time to process it. And I always tell people we were the path kind of forked in two ways. A, never enter the woods ever again, you know, or B, <laughs> go the route that we went and just start trying to do it constantly and try to document stuff. So yeah. um, we ordered a little used camcorder off of Amazon warehouse later that day. That yeah. was our first like piece of like equipment that was not necessarily set up for hiking or camping or the outdoors, but just for what you'd call like research equipment. Um, we bought that and then just the rest is history. It's just kind of snowballed since then. It is really snowballed, <laughs> really since, snowballed then. <laughs> since then. Yeah, so. it, it definitely <laughs> has. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that first experience in the woods? Uh, what exactly did you experience out there? We, like I said, we were both, we've always again had separate kind of interests, Jesse more on the paranormal, myself more. I was, I was a Bigfoot researcher for years, um, had kind of gotten out of it just because never really had anything happen. I had a, a sighting of something when I was a kid that sparked that interest, but then, um, just, you know, life got in the way. We were both living in a metro area, New Orleans. I'd get out every once in a while, but it kind of fallen by the wayside. But uh, we it was something we were still both interested in. Yeah. So we would listened to a podcast and we realized that the podcast uh, took place fairly close to where we were. So we just decided to go check it out. Um, 
Now, at the time, uh, we're we're both fairly experienced in the outdoors. Um, uh, we've both had survival training, outdoor training. Jesse more than me, to be honest with you. And uh, so we're comfortable in the woods. You know, we're, we're we're easy moving around. We can both read a map. We can navigate. And from the moment we left out of the car, uh, just weird stuff started to happen. GPS unit was going haywire. Uh, the compass <laughs> was going haywire, yeah. which we had for backup. Um, we had things get thrown at us. Mm -hmm. At first, we thought it was just stuff falling out of the trees until we actually saw one. And it wasn't coming you know, straight down. It was kind of arching in from the side, from the bushes. So we thought wow. people were messing with us at first. We heard so. very weird sounds, like uh, yeah. sort of like a chuckling in the woods. Oh, no. At one point, because the, the navigation was messing up, we knew the general way to go. Um, so we were just kind of working our way through and there's, there's really not any hiking trails back there. The guy in the podcast had worked his way back to a, a waterfall that, um, there's really no trails to. So that was kind of why he was trying to get back in there. That was something that people don't usually see. It's not a very well visited spot. Uh, so we're kind of working our way back in there. And at one point we kind of take a wrong turn, figure out we're going the wrong direction, backtrack a little bit. And it was maybe what, three minutes, four minutes, and somebody had laid these like weird wooden runes out on our return path out of it, these sticks. It, it was, was just symbols all in the path right where we had just yeah. gone through. And I'm five two. So if you're a tiny person and tiny people know this, if you're a short person, you look down a lot because you're small and you trip on everything. So I'm always looking down when I'm walking through the woods. So we went that way. We came back like three minutes later or whatever. And they were right there in the middle of our path and they they were just laid out in some sort of like symbols and it looked like runes or glyphs um but it i don't know what it meant i don't um, know who did it it, um, it so. don't know who did it um yeah. i didn't recognize any of the symbols but it was very strange because it was intricately laid out right there in the path so we continue on and we hike deeper into the woods there's a a pretty large deep creek that you have to cross over and the area where you cross over it's three pretty sizable stones that you go across and okay. get across get across the creek the creek is about 10 feet wide right yeah about 10 feet wide we get to the other side hike up a little bit get to the waterfall take a couple of pictures uh, and then it's starting to get late and we're starting to hear stuff in the woods starting, starting to, to hear, hear a lot of stuff in the woods yeah. so like voices we thought we heard like a woman's voice at one point and again, this is, I can't stress how we were, we were very accomplished hikers at the time. And we were, we were gassed at this point. Yeah. I mean, we were, we were wiped out. This was a very rough, at one point we're basically crawling up the side of this hill. Um, it's just a really steep incline. Uh, so we got up in there and we're like, the whole time we're, we're on edge. We, we saw these runes or stuff kind of flying out at us. We're yeah. still kind of, we're both armed. We always go out to the woods armed. So we're, but we're still a little on edge, you know, are there people out here messing with us? What's going on? So we decided to leave and go back at that point and yeah. try to get out of the woods before night fell. So, sure. So, um, on the, on the return trip, we came back to the Creek area and Joe goes across the Creek first. He crosses over the stones, gets to the other side. I come onto the stones and I get to the middle one and I just stop. I stop and I just, my hands fall to my side. And at this point I completely black out. Joe had to tell me what happened after that, because I just yeah. kind of shut I look down. over my shoulder and she's just swaying in place. Eyes are glassy. Um, and again, at that point, it's not that hot. We've been hydrating. We ate, you know, we, again, we, we'd go out for miles and miles every weekend. So it wasn't like exhaustion. It was a rough trip and we were tired, but it wasn't, we, we do that all the time. Nothing you know? seemed out of the ordinary. Yeah, nothing physically. was out of the ordinary, but she just glassed over. Um, she says, I don't feel well. And then she just looks like she's going down. So I jump out on these rocks, grab her, drag her across. And as soon as I get her to the shore, you know, or the side of this creek, She's just normal again. Like what happened? Yeah. What, what happened to me? But wow. I had a, just an intense wave of nausea. I, I threw up a little bit. I was just insanely nauseous and disoriented. And I was like, what happened? Like I kind of snapped too. And it's like, what happened? Um, I didn't know where I was. I didn't know what happened. So I was super nauseous and he had to get me kind of away from the Creek. The further I got away from the Creek, the better I felt. Um, and we, that's important as we finish up this story, that particular yeah. spot on the creek. But we uh, and then it was just after that, it was like the floodgates were open. Uh, we're hearing like just whoops and calls. And when I say calls, it sounded like people screaming in the woods. 
stuff's flying at us. Um, at one point, I just I couldn't even say it's out of the corner of my eye because I turned around and looked right at it, but it just looked like a face disappearing back into the foliage. And the way I describe it is people are always just like, oh, you saw Bigfoot. And I'm going, I, I don't know what it was. Um, the closest description I've ever been able to come up with in the Appalachians, people would make what they were called apple dolls. They would take little apples, you know, put them on a doll's body and then carve a face. And then as the apples dried, it gave the the appearance of an old woman, you know, the, yeah. the wrinkles that would brown up and all that. I look like I saw a life-sized version of that disappearing back into the woods just for like uh, slightly more than a split second. Just the 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 yeah. like bone white face of a wizened woman. Yeah, and it was yeah. just it wow. was at this point it was crazy. Our GPSs are still not working. Yeah, we're trying to backtrack. We're trying to get out of there. Um, it's and it just seems like everything is just not happening in the distance. It's happening right in the brush line from us. I mean, I I keep looking at her, going, "Have the car keys ready, so in case something happens." I'm just going to start shooting and you, you try to run back to the car as best you can. Uh, and it just, it followed us all the way out, literally followed us all the way out. And we, we got back to the car. We're both kind of shaken. And like I said, we don't talk on the way back. We just don't talk at all. Do you want to mention? Yeah, what was... we, we run into these <laughs> weird guys, weird guys towards the very end. We come out to where we parked at and there's this pickup truck there with these three old men. At but they're it. all wearing like insanely similar flannel plaid shirt shirts and now this is the middle of the summer these yeah. are long sleeve flannel shirts that they're wearing which is very odd and there was this very distinct pungent smell smell of just just rotting rot. flesh yeah, yeah. and one of them sitting in the back of a pickup truck on like a rocking chair and they're just staring at us and just all both of us instantly we should have been glad to see people at that point yeah um and as it was, we both just instantly go on alert. I'm backing away from them, you know, walking backwards, motioning for her to go to the car. And the guy's like, did you find the falls? And we're like, yeah, yeah, we're fine. And I'm going, there's no way these guys were following us in and, and messing with us. They're 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 all fairly advanced in age at this point. Uh, yeah. it, it could have been happenstance. It was just bizarre. And it's just bizarre. they're not they're just smiling. They're not blinking. And it's weird because then later on we heard Timothy Renner with uh, Strange Familiars. I don't know if you're familiar with this podcast yeah, talking about yeah. the flannel man phenomenon yes. and yeah. how these like people run into these guys who act extremely strange, kind of almost like a men in black type phenomenon, you know, look like normal people, but don't act normal, you know, not very expression, you know, pretty expressionless in the face. Um, so we we left out and like I said, we got home and then we start looking into that spot a little bit more. And we realized that there's a, a wilderness therapy camp. I don't know if you're familiar with what a wilderness therapy camp is, but if you have a generally it's teens that they'll send to them. Now, this can be anything that ranges from kids with like video game addictions mm -hmm. to kids who are stealing cars yeah. um, and stuff like that. So they'll send them off to wilderness therapy camp where they unplug and the kids okay. have to go camping and learn survival skills. And it kind of it's supposed to be kind of like a disciplinary thing that kind of scared straight kind of in the woods, yeah, right, I guess. Right. But um, like some of these camps are rife with, with corruption and yeah. just weird stuff, like cult weird activity, occult but, activity. But there's it, one of these yeah. near there. And we found out just kind of researching the area because we're going, has anybody else had like strange encounters up here? Uh, and really one of the only things we could find on that area was about this wilderness therapy camp and how a kid had escaped a few years previously to this. He had been missing for about two weeks mm -hmm. um, and they found his body in that creek Where that we crossed that I like, had that experience wow. had the experience at, at uh, with his pelvis and legs broken, crushed, saying that it looked like he had fallen from a great distance and then just died of exposure. Uh, wow. So, and we're like, we're only, this going, this he, is straight out of missing 411 yeah, at this point. And, and he it, had been missing for two weeks, but when they found his body, he had only been dead for about two days yeah, at they, that point. But his pelvis was completely crushed. Um, his leg bones were crushed and he was found in the creek where I had that experience. And yeah, like wow. Joe said, he fell from a was like he fell from a great height. There's no cliffs around there or anything like that. Um, but it was just so bizarre. That and I was like, OK, so next bizarre. time we need. Yeah. Next time we need to do research on the area before we go there. <laughs> yeah. Again, this was just like a little legend trip, like just like a little Saturday yeah. outing at for us. Uh, at yeah. That point. Yeah. Yeah. Almost but at that point, we just kind of, <laughs> yeah, it did. Well, it did. And it's weird because when we don't even really talk about this that much, because when you explain it, it, we can't convey the sense of, of just 
terror that was just in the air. And I, I don't say that lightly. I mean, if you watch our videos, we go out in the woods by ourselves all the time. Yeah. You know I'm saying deep into the woods, we get into some pretty sketchy areas and it's tense, but we, you know, we do, it's another day at the office. Like we always say, there was something about this place that just had us on edge, just almost from the get go. And it just built and built and built. And like I said, it, it, we were going to go one of two ways at that point. Either we were just going to sell the backpacks and our hiking boots and never go in the woods again, or we were just going to start looking into this stuff deeper. And that's exactly what we did. It became we just, we an, went, an like, obsession. So. Yeah, we just went head on into it. And we've just uh, we've been kind of going at this and plugging away like a fray train at this. And it's just it's completely changed our lives. It's become a, a very obsessive pursuit at this point. Mm -hmm. It's taken over everything that we do. Um, it is what we do 24 seven. We're constantly working on this project that is Hellbent Holler. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That was a uh, very, very, very interesting and terrifying story. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. My gosh. Um, well, that was, uh, definitely coming in, coming in, hot, coming in hot at the very beginning <laughs> of the we're, show. We're, here. we're kind of, we're, we're kind of known for coming in hot. In the situation. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and what's weird is, is that we went out and I think the thing that intrigued us so much is again, I came at, I came at everything from like, I was a flesh and blood Bigfoot guy. It's an undiscovered ape in the woods. She was a paranormal researcher, haunted houses and stuff like that. And what we encountered didn't really fall into either one of those boxes. I mean, it was yeah. it's, uh, people this day just go, what do you think you were experiencing? And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, we can't even rule out the fact that maybe there was a group of people out there just trying to mess with us. But then you get into some like the other stuff, like how did they mess with our GPSs? How did our why did our compass start to like malfunction? Yeah, um, you have to do some mental gymnastics yeah, to kind of explain a hoax away. But we never saw anything other than just that that face that we saw uh, and then the glyphs that we came across. But it was just weird because it was just the. If we had had a Bigfoot sighting, I mean, that would be something, but it would be something that you could kind of put a pin in. Yeah, digest yeah. and put it in an easy box and explain it to people. All we saw Bigfoot up here in this waterfall, but we're trying to explain what we happened and it's just all over the board. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just weird stuff, you know? And I, I think it was just the, the bizarreness of it and how it just wasn't what either one of us really expected if we had gone, okay, we're going to go out looking for strange activity. We we were expecting something more familiar, something that kind of followed yeah. the the well-known kind of storylines of Bigfoot or this or that. And it just, we didn't get that. We just got something that we, we really couldn't explain after it happened at that point. Yeah. Super interesting. And it seems like you, things like that seem to find you when you're not looking for it. It just kind of creeps up on you, <laughs> at least yeah. in my experience. Um, but I wanted to And then once you Oh, sorry. I was going to Go say ahead. and once you No, yeah. Uh but also when you expose yourself to these things and you look for these things, they start looking back at you. Yes. Um and I think that we've really experienced that doing this work. The more and more we do this work, it seems like things are ramping up in a way. Um that the more we look for this stuff, the weirder kind of stuff comes after us. So. Yeah, yeah. Definitely got to <laughs> watch out. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to circle back um so Joe, you mentioned that you had a, a Bigfoot experience when you were you're, you were younger, and I, that's kind of how you got into this. Uh, mm -hmm. Jesse, have you ever had be, like when you were younger? Was there like a paranormal experience that kind of uh, swayed you in the direction of being interested in all this stuff? Well, I have I have a very strange family. Uh, growing up, I everybody in my family does. It's something they talk to ghosts or they do divination. Um, my grandfather has like conversed with the devil before. It's stuff like that has just been kind of a thing in my family. For Our very family is from like just the, the mountains of Western North Carolina. Yeah. Which, you know, they've seen some population increase over the past few years. This area has been uh, kind of a hot spot to move into from other parts of the country. But up until just a few years ago, these were very sparsely populated, like little areas, you know, and a lot of these families like um, Jesse's one of the few people from her family that have ever kind of moved away left and the, left I'm, that area. I'm the, I'm the first one to ever move out of the county. I but think. I mean, up until just a few years ago, you had just like mountain witches, you know, you didn't necessarily go to the doctor. You know, if you had a toothache, you went to the the old woman that lived the next mountain over to, to get something done. So. It's often referred to as granny witches as well. So, um, but yeah, huh. I, I had a great aunt that was a, a 
famous like granny witch in the area. And uh, so there's like lots of stories in the area and like tales about her. But yeah, so that was always a part of my life. I grew up in that kind of environment and I had experiences. I saw things. I had experiences where um, I was and I don't want to say I, I'm an empath. I don't like to use that kind of terminology because you'll just have everybody in the world, like on every ghost show, I'm an empath, you know, <laughs> but it's, it's, I have, there's some sort of weird, like, I guess, psychic opening in my brain that it's, if I'm in somewhere where there is something going on, so it will affect me and I can sense it and, and I, I can experience it in some way or another. So that's been just happening my entire life. And it's weird because like I, I mentioned, I had kind of gotten out of Bigfoot research because nothing was really happening. You know, I was going to all the hot spots down on that part of the country, you know, Honey Island, which is outside yes. of New Orleans, yes. uh, down near the Texas, Louisiana border. They call that Monster Central. And because there's so much reported activity, I never had anything happen to me, man. I'd kind of given up on it. Um, and I say this to people all the time that uh, I'll go to some of these hot spots that she and I go to right now uh, where we experience like a fair amount of activity. I'll go there by myself and nothing happens. So, I mean, that's that's been re- repeated at this point. I mean, literally, I we can go to somewhere three weeks in a row and have something happen. And I can go on that fourth week by myself. And it's just it's a pleasant walk in the woods at that point, like literally nothing goes on at all. So um, it's it's weird how they say that certain people maybe and, you know, entice it in or bring it in or activity is attracted to certain people. And I can, I mean, I can't speak for those people, but it, with, at least with Jesse, it seems to be the case. So um, it's, like I said, it's, we've, I've, I've had a hundred percent unsuccess rate going out by myself up here so far. Uh, <laughs> and nothing at all has ever happened with me um, in the slightest without her at this point. So. Interesting. Yeah. That's why you're not going to have like a Joe solo spin. Yeah. That's show. why we can't, it's why we want to like <laughs> split up, you know, me do a project, her do a project, because I just won't have a project. So, you know. <laughs> you got the magnet and then you got the repelling force, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. Uh, so you two live in Appalachia. That's kind of where you primarily do your, your mm-hmm. research and on the ground investigations. Uh, I've noticed recently that Appalachian lore has gained quite a big following online like you go on to mm-hmm. social media and all these people are talking about like don't look in the trees at night or don't whistle uh in the woods because some bad stuff will come your way what would you mm-hmm. say are some of your favorite legends uh from your region that uh uh you know of and and have you actually gone out and investigated any of those in particular so far Tons of them. I um, think what I think just to address the the gaining popularity of Appalachian folklore, I think where a lot of that comes from is the Appalachian mountain range is one of the oldest mountain ranges in the world. Um, it is very rugged in a lot of places. There are places that people have never set foot here. Um, and we have a very populous country, and yet we have huge swaths of land where people have never set foot before. You also have the stories that you hear about feral people, people that are living out in the woods and they're completely disconnected from society. And they, we don't know what they're up to. We don't know how they live or what they're doing. And that kind of adds a kind of a weird element to the whole thing. Mm. There's a lot of mystery. There's a lot of mystery still left in these woods and these mountains. And I think a lot of people are looking for that. That's something that I think everybody kind of needs in their life. And I think that's why it's so interesting is because it's, it's frightening. It's mysterious. Um, these places are hard to get to and, and not many people have been there or seen them, but yeah, you can go ahead and talk about some of the legends that we've looked into. Yeah. We, like I said, we started off just with the legend tri- tripping aspect of it. Uh, and then we quickly just kind of abandoned that and then just got flat out into the, and I don't even know how to explain it, what we do. I mean, I, I don't, wouldn't say we're researchers or maybe investigators, um, uh, we do some stuff that would maybe be considered research. We do a lot of mapping. We do a lot of, of trying to, to to gather data and sift through that data and look for patterns. But at heart, what we're doing is, is we're going out doing field investigations. That's what we we enjoy the most. That's We seem to have some, a pretty good success rate doing that. But the thing that's really struck us as odd is that there's two, it's almost like there's two categories of Appalachian lore, basically. 
there's that that kind of interesting story around the campfire type stuff, um, almost like the Paul Bunyan type things, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, just the kind of like every like little area has got like a little, you know, a little boogeyman that they talk about, but it's usually tongue in cheek and it's kind of fun and it's just to scare the kids. Yeah. And then there's that other kind of darker, more I guess realistic is the word to use for it, like category of stuff. And a lot of that has parallels in you know, the Cherokee were settled all through this area. Um, and it's one of the things that we really look for is, is we look for areas where people are experiencing anomalous activity or strange phenomena. And there's a parallel with Cherokee lore to that. Yes. Um, one of the areas that we go to we, we fight this battle every time we post anything about it because people are like, oh, you've got Bigfoot through there. And I'm going, I don't think it's Bigfoot. We're finding small footprints. We're finding small stuff. And this just so happens to be in an area that is very strong with like, you know, legends of the Cherokee little people at this point. Um, that's one of the things that we really kind of look at is an area where the stories maybe started up with the Cherokee were there, continued into when European settlers arrived on the scene. And then people are still experiencing it like nowadays, the names might've changed, but at the core of it, the descriptions of this activity is the same. There's an area we go to that we have caught these weird, just anomalous booms. Um, yeah. I, I really? trying to describe, describe them to people. I we always have a, we have a video where you can actually hear them. It's it's the title of the video on our channel is breaks, booms and howls. Okay. And we kept, we're up on this Ridge. I set the camera up and we were kind of just getting ready for night because um, we we transition from day to night. We do a lot of scouting during the day and then we'll transition to our night gear. And um, we're doing that. And I had the camera set up and you can just hear I have it just running and we're kind of, you know, flashlights and all that stuff. And you're just in the distance here. Boom. And we both go, you know, we have a huge reaction. We're way out in the woods. There's nothing else around. There's no right. quarries nearby. Um, you can try to think of like any sort of like sensible explanation. What could this be? There's no quarries around. There's no heavy construction. We are way out in the mountains. Um, and so you hear that boom. And then a short time later, you hear another one. I think I captured maybe three or four in that video. That's wild. But <laughs> The legend, it like I think you described it as it sounded like a cargo container being lifted like, and then dropped from a great height. Like somebody li lifted up a, a packed shipping container and then just dropping it because we heard it and we felt it. And what's interesting is, is that those booms have been reported back because people have gone all oh, somebody's out there letting off fireworks, somebody shooting Tannerite, which is an explosion that people shoot. It's kind of like a target type thing. Uh, there's mining going on that they're blasting. Well, those stories go back to when the Europeans first arrived on the scene and they called it ghostly cannon fire. They, they thought that a battle had maybe taken place there and that there were ghosts up there setting off ghostly cannons. Uh, the Native Americans talked about that there were fire breathing demons that lived in the mountains. And then it was the sound of them playing some sort of like Native American handball game. And that was the sound of the balls like landing on the, the ground as they played. But those exact sounds have been reported back as long as there's been people in that area to report them. Yeah. Wow. Um, and super interesting. And we've noticed that we've noticed that that when we go in and when somebody will contact us with something that maybe they're experiencing, that's one of the first things we do is we look into that area to see what's the what's the folklore of that area what's what have people reported seeing in the past and don't get hung up on the names get up on the, the descriptions of what they're dealing with uh, yeah the, i think i think the first thing we always do is we pick up james mooney's book uh, myths and legends of the cherokee yeah. and that's like the first thing we do that's that's where we go because that's kind of our source material go back to the beginning go back this is the earliest source material we have um, on the history of the area and the folklore of the area. So I think we start with that book and then we kind of just come forward from there and get a real detailed picture of the history of these sightings and these experiences in this area. And then we will go into the area ourselves and investigate them. Um, but there's some parallels to that too, like with another legend that we've investigated, the Brown Mountain Lights. There's a similar parallel to mm -hmm. that. Brown Mountain Lights, if you're not familiar with it, is it's in Brown Mountain, North Carolina. And it is this anomalous light show, basically, that occurs yes. in the middle of the woods. They rise from the mountain. They're down in the valley. This is insanely rugged and remote, but you can see it from the overlook. So you can go to the overlook. There's a little parking area there and everything, but you can just go and see these lights. The history, these lights have been going on since, I mean, 
prehistory, you know, Mm -hmm. pre-written history, people have experienced these lights. The Cherokee say that it is the ghosts of it's, it's, it was like the ghosts of the maidens who are walking, looking for their fallen braves. Um, that it is their torchlight out there. There's mm-hmm. been a lot of different different like speculations about what it is, but it's been going on forever. Um, during one period of time, they thought it was the lights from a train passing through, but a washout took that train out of that area. So that was, you know, basically debunked at that yep. point. Yeah, the train stopped <laughs> running, answer. but the lights kept going on. So Yeah. yeah. Um, so we actually went to the Brown Mountain Lights. We decided kind of on a whim to go to the Brown Mountain Lights cool. because we live in this we live in this region. And we were like, we have never been to the check out the Brown Mountain Lights. So we went there to go check it out. And um it was a full moon and we went out there with all of our equipment and everything. And the minute we get out onto the overlook to look over, we just see one immediately down in the Valley and wow. we start filming. <laughs> we did a live stream. Like, yeah. we're, so we're filming with our, with our, um, our full color night vision camera. And we get probably, I want to say the best footage of the Brown mountain lights anybody has ever gotten because we have the tech to do it. Uh, that's one thing that kind of differentiates us from everybody else is we have all this technology and we use it in the proper way to gather this evidence and this right. data. But we use a full color night vision camera and we got probably some of the best footage of the Brown Mountain Lights I've ever seen. Yeah. I'll say that. And we live awesome. streamed the entire time we were <laughs> filming this, too. So, yeah, that's, yeah, that's it's, amazing. Uh, yeah, it's uh, so if you ask our, our favorite legends of the area, <sighs> I mean, obviously, like Bigfoot's the thing that everybody knows about. Um, and there are there's a few there's a few Native American par- parallels to, to Sasquatch. And if you go around this area, people have got like Bigfoot fever. You know what I'm saying? So you go around every old mountain road you go down. They've got like a Bigfoot cut out in their front yard or Booger Hollow Road. Um, yeah. So you see a lot of that. But the stuff that really interests us the most is I'd have to say Anomalous light activity is something that we've experienced a great deal of. So we've we've kind of gravitated in towards that 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 uh, road. And we've found those anomalous lights kind of in areas where other kind of strange activity is supposed to take place. Uh, the little people aspect of it, if if you had told me 10 years ago that there might be a chance that that's real, I just I would have laughed in your face. You know what I'm saying? I'm just like, ah, whatever. Uh, we found some weird evidence up here. We found small footprints on the the North Georgia mountains in the middle of the winter. Um, I don't think anybody's got their six or seven year old kids out there barefoot, you know, kids who've never worn shoes before with splayed eight miles into the woods. Yeah. So um, if you had to ask us what interests us the most, it's, it's probably those legends at this point. Um, The area that we're currently researching in North Georgia, it's got a lot, it's a, it's a freak show. It's got a a ton of, of strange activity going on in there. Um, no Sasquatch activity, as far as we can tell, but we are finding, we're finding little stuff. We're finding like little tree twists. We're finding like little, what looks like small stick structures. We're finding small bear footprints, you know, in the mud and then in the snow. We've discovered the a network of small tunnels, tunnels that are up there, uh, which are bizarre. That kind of snake around through the mountain. And yeah. people are like, oh, it's juvenile Sasquatch. And I'm like, well, where are the parents at? You yeah. know, I mean, you got like a a Bigfoot lost boys situation going up here where there's no adults. I'm going, cause we don't find big footprints up through there. We don't yeah. find any of that stereotypical large Sasquatch stuff. So that's something that we've really gravitated to over the past year is kind of learning more about those little people legends up through there. And then talking to other people in this region who have had, you know, some people have had multiple experiences with them. Some people have just had like a single sighting, but it's out there. It just doesn't make its way to the, the public eye because you know, you you catch a lot of ridicule for coming forward with a Bigfoot story, which is pretty much in, you know, pretty well known publicly at this point. But yeah, come forward and say that you saw like a a, a little man when you were out hiking, you know what I'm saying, who threw rocks at you and then just seemed to disappear into the woods. You're just you're you, nobody's going to accept that story unless they have had experiences like that themselves. So right. um, so it's the weirder stuff that we have a tendency to kind of gravitate towards, especially when that weirder stuff seems like it actually has some backing in reality, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely some compelling evidence for sure. And these, these little footprints were, I assume humanoid in, in shape. Yes. And that's yes. why yeah. people are yeah. like, oh, we found the first time we found it, we were out uh, in an area and we kept hearing 
the the best description of it is is if you've ever heard the Sierra sounds before, like yes. that kind of faux speech that they describe. We were hearing that, but it sounded really high pitched. We couldn't make out what it was, and we end up leaving the trail. We were actually on a trail this time and just kind of going up the side of the mountain because we thought we saw a cave entrance. We get up there and we find this entrance to a cave, and there's these small bare footprints there, and the there's kind of like some sandy dirt in front of the the cave entrance. That's and, our very first video. Yeah, and Jesse's got very <laughs> okay. small hands. They were about the size of her hand at that point. Yeah. And we we thought that was interesting. We looked into it. We never had anything else happen in that area. And then we moved on into another the area that we're researching now. And we've that's where we found these like just little bare, almost human like footprints, but the toes are splayed out. Uh, we did a, find one that had six toes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a, we but flat feet. And then huh. we've, as we've talked to that and people have seen those videos and they know where we're at, we've got other people contact us mm -hmm. with photos of similar stuff that they've seen up there. And one person was just like, I thought somebody, you know, that there were some kids that maybe kind of ran away and were hiding up there. And I'm going in the North Georgia mountains in the wintertime. I mean, barefoot. I yeah. mean, it's we're up there freezing and we're bundled up with, you know, insulated socks and everything like that. So um, it's 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 strange and it's it's something that doesn't get as much talk and it's it, it sounds kind of humorous although there's little people in the mountains but um those stories stretch back i mean those stories still i mean you could even like you could even like bring parallels to the fey it's yeah, similar yeah. to the fey yeah that's exactly what i was thinking too i recently did an episode about the alaska triangle and mm -hmm. the uh native tribes up there have a legend of diminutive beings called the inukin and it sounds very yes, there's a, we're pointy actually heads, pointy ears. <laughs> three and there are tall. people up there that will yeah. to this day, both uh, both First Nations, like, you know, Native Americans and um, the descendants of European settlers will tell you that they see that. I, I've been in contact with a guy who's a Bigfoot researcher who's also, you know, he was a grizzly guide up there for years. He's retired now, but that was his bread and butter. That's how he that's how he fed himself is they would take people out on on bear hunts, basically. Yeah. And he's had several encounters with like just small kind of like trickster beings and he's terrified of them. You know what I'm yeah. saying? He's, he's more scared of that than um, anything else that he's really dealt with up there because of the trickster aspect of it. Um, but yeah, there's people out there that have, and again, like Jesse said, there's, there's parallels, there's parallels all over the world on that. Like they, you know, they call them little people here. Uh, Europeans, they have like their fae and fairy legends that kind of match up with it. You know, little mischievous people that live in the woods that may or may not cause you harm. You know, they might just kind of pull you off trail for a little while and get you lost and inconvenienced, or you just might go missing and never be seen again. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it depends on what side of the bed they wake up on that day, I suppose. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> what side of the stump? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the stump. There you go. Um, so uh, how do you guys prepare to go out on investigations? Do you like divvy up responsibilities or specialties? And, and what do you do about, um, you guys have a lot of gear. So what, like, what do you do? What are the logistics of, of getting ready for going out on your treks? Logistics are a nightmare. Um, <laughs> because it's the reason, why we, hell. The, the reason why we have so much gear is Again, we started off, like I mentioned earlier, we started off just to try to document it. We got like a little secondhand off-brand video camera from Amazon Warehouse just to kind of document us going out. And what's happened over the years is we'll have stuff happen. We'll experience activity and we we can't catch it. We can't record it. We can't document it. And it just that's just the most frustrating in the world thing in the world is just to be left with like another story to tell with yeah. nothing to back it up. So a lot of times it seems like we're chasing stuff with tech. We'll have something happen and we'll be like, you know, if we'd had this with us, we would have been able to document it. So we go out and we get that. So we just built our, our little arsenal one piece at a time over the space of a few years. But um, it'll generally depend upon what we're going out for. And the reason why it's frustrating is, is that in certain areas, what you go out for is the one thing that you don't experience. Yeah. Um, we were having an area that had had a few Bigfoot sightings in it that we go out and we're geared up for like a Bigfoot hunt. We've got like casting plaster, you know, we've got our tape measures. We've got all the stuff that you would take out to like, you know, try to document evidence of Sasquatch. And it was like we were in a haunted forest at that point. I mean, we got in there that night. There's anomalous lights. There's just all of this stuff. 
and we're frustrated because we don't have anything to capture that. Yeah. So we go back out the following week. And we are limited on what we can bring, yeah. even though we have all this equipment. We're limited on what we can bring because it, we have to be able to hike all this stuff out. We hike miles and miles into the woods and we have to be able to hike this stuff out. It has to go in our backpacks. We have to be able to carry it. We have to still carry water because um, we're out there. So we have to be able to kind of you have to pare down what you take every time you go deep in the woods. So we. We go back the following week and we're geared up for a ghost hunt now. And <laughs> uh, we literally get out of the car and we start hiking in to get to the connecting trail to take us to where we need to go to. And there is the, we've only really ever found one stereotypical big, like big footprint in the mud. And it's right there, right in front of us. And, and, it was I'm, going, perfect. and I'm going, we've got stuff for like, we've got like EMF detectors and everything like that at this point. So that area, it was like, no matter how we prepared, we were never prepared for the right thing in that area and i always went it's almost like you're dealing with something that's that's prescient something that kind of knows how you're coming out prepared and, and it's just going to do the exact opposite on that and area. that goes back to that trickster element yeah. that it just seems like the phenomenon just changes and kind of messes with you in a way that it's fully aware of you and what your intentions are but it changes and it adjusts and it's almost like it's laughing at you mm -hmm. but well it generally it's the the history of the area will kind of kind of dictate what sort of gear we take out for it. Uh, like Jesse mentioned, you know, we'll post a video and everybody's like, you should have this with you. And I'm going, man, the backpack's only so big. You know, <laughs> I mean, anything we have to carry our normal food and water, first aid supplies, uh, just the typical navigation type stuff, depending on the type of the year, maybe you're carrying some like warm, you know, like a jacket, hat, gloves, uh, protection. You know, we carry like, we, we carry firearms. I know that's not everybody's gig, but where we go out to, there's really nobody else around. I mm -hmm. mean, this is, we go into some pretty sketchy areas sometimes. Well, with some pretty sketchy history, you know, uh, mysterious disappearances, people found dead. So we, we go out arms. So we got to carry that. That's extra weight. So, so you got all you, that. And then now, now, now let's carry, get to this paranormal research equipment. Yeah, so we try to divvy it up as best we can, depending on what we think we're going to experience. And it's not always right. Uh, it's not always the right mix of stuff. I mean, because when we get down to it, it's, it's I'm looking at the cases stacked up on the far end of the room right now. I mean, we've got everything from like night vision cameras, night vision monoculars, thermal imagers. Um, I, I don't even know how many sorts of different digital recorders, parabolic dishes, the ability to recharge stuff. And then the sensor tech like EMF, tri-field, Geiger. Geiger counters, spectrum analyzers, um, We've got something pretty cool right now that we're kind of experimenting around with that that you don't really see that often. But infrasound was something that I was always interested in. That whole Bigfoot trope of people being hit by infrasound. Right. Um, for me, that that explanation never made sense. I mean, I know that that they call it the zapping effect. I know that's happening. I've seen it happen to her before. Yeah, something is definitely happening there. I and, just but don't I just, think it's infrasound. I just don't think it's infrasound. And I'm always just like, how do you know that's infrasound? Well, that's just that's just what they say. So we. Had a, a scientific instrumentation company up in Waynesboro, Virginia, build me a, a, a piece of gear that can detect and record, you know, basically monitor infrasound at this point. So we've got that to kind of go out there because I want to see if people in these areas where there's Bigfoot activity, if there's infrasound taking place. So, yeah. so we're, we're heavy on the tech, but like a lot of times, like I said, it's just, again, it, it, it doesn't do you any good if it's still in the back of the truck, you yeah. know, and sometimes that's where it's at because we can't carry it. And our angle, too, is, it's you know, you can only do so much going out and banging on trees and howling at the moon. Uh, you, you're not getting anywhere with it. it. We really need to start gathering real data, like gathering real numbers, data, readings. So that's why we have all this instrumentation is that we want to be able to gather solid data. You want to be able to look at it and say, OK, this is this and this and this is going on. Um, and you can sometimes maybe find correlation or at least find some sort of a trend of what's happening and kind of put that together and maybe give us a few more pieces of the puzzle as if we plug that data in and kind of get more information about this. Yeah. Cause that was one of the things that always, always kind of bothered me is those Bigfoot tropes. Like I said, like infrasound, it's kind of just taken as a matter of fact, but it's, I think it's just cause it's been repeated so often that people just, and I'm going, why, why do you think that's what's causing this? And a lot of times, especially with Sasquatch, people experience some really weird stuff beyond just seeing what looks like an upright ape in the woods. You know, they have that zapped effect. You hear about self-illuminating eyes. Some of Mind the, speak? Well, yeah, some of the weirder stuff like yeah. mind speak and cloaking. And I think a lot with a lot of that, what people did is to try to keep 
a hold of that it's just a monkey in the woods theory they would look at other things that occur in the natural world in the animal kingdom and then they would kind of cherry pick that you know right um well you know so one of those big but i'm at the end of the day i'm going all right well yeah that animal does it but that doesn't mean that that if you think this is an animal that this animal does it it's just it's spoken of like it's it's incontrovertible fact it's something that can't be challenged for it so we go really gear heavy to try to kind of try to challenge some of that stuff or back it up or maybe see a lot of times, you know, we're gathering data. We might not know what that data means at that point, but we got it. Yeah. We can, we can see those patterns in it. Um, we have, and that's one of the things that I always like talk to people about is that, that if you look at that zapped effect that people report, you know, that they associate with Sasquatch. Well, I mean, if you look at, at the effects that people have, uh, you know, it's it's in the news right now a lot. A lot of people are talking about it, but the physical effects from UAP encounters, they're extremely similar, you know. Yeah. And but here's the deal is that the UAP encounters have some sort of some sort of testing going on with it. You know, they're examining the people afterwards. There's there's a certain mat matter, you know, certain degree of like data collection that goes on with Sasquatch or any of this other stuff. It's usually just another campfire story to tell. So that was our big thing is, is that some of this stuff might be outside of the realm of our scientific understanding, but elements of it might be detectable. And we can, again, we're all about seeing those patterns. We're yeah. all about trying to like detect those patterns to see what's going on. Um, we're of the mind and we, Jesse and I kind of agree upon this. We don't agree upon everything, but uh, we think that a lot of what you would consider class B Sasquatch encounters you know where you don't see the creature but you have other stuff happen to you you have sound yes. smells smells something's thrown at you you heard a scream this or that well i mean if you were experiencing that activity in the side of an old house you would automatically assume that it's haunted but because it's happening in the woods you automatically ascribe it to bigfoot why you know what i'm saying it's I mean, like a, you you hear um hoof beats you don't think it's a zebra you think it's a horse you yeah know? but at the same token until you walk out and take a look you don't know whether it's a horse or a zebra at that yeah. point. Um, so we we that's our thing is, is to try to get out, try to collect data, try to. And again, like I said, we don't take it's I always tell people we're trying to investigate irrational topics in as a rational manner as possible uh, to try to get out there. And that a lot of times we don't even know what the data means, but we're collecting it. I mean, in some of these areas where we're finding footprints, we're finding, you know, EMF spikes. In the middle of the woods for no reason at all um we're finding trace you know elevated rel uh, sorry elevated levels of trace radiation in some of these areas yeah we've actually found a good bit of that around stuff where we've had anomalous light activity so, yeah, so and then there's 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 connections with that with the uap phenomenon with that too is that you have like elevated levels of radiation when you have these uap encounters and we're experiencing the same kind of readings when we're going out and finding these anomalous lights. Yeah, I mean, and it's and it's weird because I, I started off as like a, a flesh and blood Bigfoot. It's just an undiscovered ape. And then I kind of gradually morphed into, oh, it's a relic. It's a relic hominid of some sort. And nowadays, I don't know what it is. All I can tell you is, is that it's whatever's going on out there. There's 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 a lot more to it than a lot of people think. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we kind of pride ourselves in is that people will describe themselves as a as like a Bigfoot hunter or a Bigfoot researcher. And obviously anything that they encounter, they try to tailor it to that worldview at that point. Yeah. Um, if you're a UFO investigator, you're going to try to tailor everything that you encounter to kind of fit into that box, you know, to maybe kind of back up your, your, your UFO research at this point. Um, with us, we everything is so cross spectrum. It's, yeah. it's, there's so many elements of all of these different things. I used to absolutely hate UFO stuff and alien stuff. And now I'm just, we're experiencing so much crazy stuff that would line up with that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I totally believe in what, what the, that's, what's presenting itself, but it's also showing up with other stuff. It's showing up with what you would consider classic Bigfoot activity or dog man stuff. And it seems like a lot of this stuff is kind of happening in tandem. Um, so you kind of have to approach it from a cross spectrum mentality that it's you've got so many elements here that it's it's obviously not just one type of phenomenon. And if you close yourself off and just look at it from one perspective, you're going to miss a whole slew of evidence. Yeah. And it's and 
it's I, I was at the same token. I was never into the UFO type stuff. I mean, I was familiar with like the main cases like Roswell, stuff like that. But I, I was into Bigfoot. That was it. You know, I didn't really know a lot about other stuff. I mean, you're aware of the main stuff like Loch Ness Monster and everything. But I just other than just like a passing knowledge of it. Um, and nowadays we're it's like we're playing catch up in a lot of fields yeah. at this point. Um, again, like I said, if just you'd always hear that kind of that that stereotypical you know oh a ufo landed and a bigfoot got out and everybody just kind of snickered at that story do you know what i'm saying you know that's like that's national Enquirer territory at this point you know right um and i can't say that's happening but i can say that that we're experiencing what could be considered bigfoot related activity in areas where we're seeing anomalous lights in the sky and we're and if it's a monkey then why are we picking up elevated area like levels of radiation in some of these areas why are we picking up weird rf spikes um we're picking up stuff that doesn't seem like it would be associated with just an undiscovered biological terrestrial creature now again i'm not saying that something's getting out of a ufo but there's something else going on there other than just a, a big undiscovered ape it maybe is way more complex than that maybe it's separate phenomena that's attracted to the same area for different reasons um, maybe there's some sort of association that goes on there, but that's been one of the hardest things for me to kind of come to grips with is because I used to laugh at a lot of this stuff, um, like the whole dog man topic that we've been involved with. I mean, up until just a few years ago, uh, I had nothing but scorn for that topic at this point. I just thought it was ridiculous. And it wasn't until we started looking into it a little bit that if you're going to be honest with yourself and look at the the experiences and the the anecdotal accounts and then you know, the evidence and everything like that, there's something going on out there. I don't know what, but I, I don't laugh at that topic anymore. Yeah, um, definitely not. I, I, our first trip to the LBL was actually just kind of a, what, like a cryptozoology sightseeing tour, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we went up there and we got the evidence we did and had the experiences we did. And that totally turned everything on its head when it came to the subject of Dogman and us and how we thought about it. And we had to really step back and reconsider what we... What we thought this phenomenon was, was it real? Um, what, what it could be? What is it capable of? Um, now we've, you've got the, it. now it's real to us, you know? It's like, oh God, it's not just um, a creepypasta. It's not just this story. Yeah. It's, this is something that is real. And you have to kind of come to grips with that. And it's, sometimes it's a little difficult to admit you were wrong about something, but you have to, if you want to pursue it any further. It's not even right. difficult to admit that you were wrong about it. For me, it's difficult to admit that you're associated with it in the first place nowadays. <laughs> um, again, because I just, I associated that topic with just like Jesse said, with like creepypasta, with sensational, like YouTube accounts and stories um and doing what we did we would get people contact us all the time you know sending us video links to have you heard this story about this government assassin who fought dog man in the apple <laughs> yeah i've heard about it man you know whatever <laughs> um we started getting reports from just north of us in north carolina um the first one came from a, another guy that i know who's a longtime bigfoot researcher who was just like hey uh he's in another part of the country but he was like I'm going to share this with you. Do whatever you want to with it. I, I don't even know what I think about it. But he was down here on vacation during Christmas, uh, just north of us. And uh, Christmas morning, his daughter went out for his jo a jog. She's a collegiate runner of some sort. I don't know whether it's short distance, long distance or what. But she went out for like a jog and a black wolf-like creature came out of the bushes, started chasing her, and then went up on two legs and was running after her. And she said at that point, she just turned her head, put on the speed and got back to the cabin. And he's like, going, listen, it's my daughter. I don't think she's lying to me. Um, I don't yeah. think she's making the story up. I'm just going to give this to you to do with what you will. And I just wow. kind of went, oh, that's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. And then just whatever. I, and then we started and it was weird because right after he told me that and that hadn't happened recently, that had happened about a year previously. But as soon as he told me that story, it's like the floodgates opened. Up. Yeah, it was very weird how this happened. Yeah, we start getting stories and accounts, just people sending them to us out of the blue. But it's all in line, like all of these stories and these accounts that people are sending to us and asking us to come check stuff out. It's all in line. Like you look at it on a map and you have 
incident one, incident two, incident three. It's all kind of in a line. Um, and they were all lining up and we just started the floodgates open on it. These are all independent people contacting us independently. They don't know each other. They're not involved with the, in most of them. None of them are involved with cryptozoology at all or mm. anything paranormal. These are normal people. Um, but they just came to us with these reports and we looked into a bunch of them. We actually went up to one area and met a gentleman and he told us his story and uh, we went to where he had his experience and we've actually become very good friends with this gentleman. And um, we, there was a lady who was contacting us that a dog man was trying to get into her house, that it was urinating on the side of her house oh, no. that actually led to us. That led to us buying a UV light. So we could go over there and, <laughs> investigate and, none, of, it. and none of them are really using the terminology dog man. I mean, yeah, it's, just, it's always again, werewolf. Yeah, these people are not people that are into the yeah. the internet cryptozoology type, you know, field. Uh, they're actually they're calling them like just you know upright wolves, werewolves. But I mean, we're we're getting all these reports, and they're striking similarities with them. And we're meeting these people, and they seem credible. I mean, the the first person Jesse mentioned, I mean, he's he's a minister with his church. I mean, he's he's a pillar of his community, and he's just like I can't explain it. This is just what happened to me. Yeah. Um, and then we go into those areas to talk to these people. And then we start finding other people in the process of just researching this that have had similar encounters. So at this point, we're looking at each other going, something's up here. And But you're still kind of leaning towards. I, I, there's a term called the boggle threshold that I use all the time. Um, and a parapsychologist, I can't remember what her name was, came up with that. And she talks about how even people who are open to some weird stuff, everybody's got that boggle threshold. You're willing to accept up to this level, but then after that, once it crosses that line, your mind just boggles and you kick it out. Um, that Bigfoot researcher who doesn't, you know, just thinks that UFOs are just the, the craziest thing ever, or um, or that ghost hunter who thinks that the idea of something living in the woods and not being discovered is just complete hogwash. So basically you're lying in the sand of the weird. Yeah. And that was kind of past our boggle threshold. I'm just going, come on, man, like an upright. Yeah. Like Wolf, that's just ridiculous. I'm I'm willing to believe the Bigfoot stuff, you know, <laughs> and we've experienced the lights and we've seen some other weird stuff. But, but werewolves, this, you know, <laughs> this is just weird. Like you start going, how could it be? How can it exist? I mean, so we kind of jokingly said we were going to we called it Dogman Summer. We were going to spend a summer and just kind of go around and hit all these dogman spots. And yeah. LBL, Land Between the Lakes, was the first one we went to. Nice. Yeah, and we I did the research. Hear more about LBL, actually. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So we went there and like the first night we were there, we had like a weird experience. We caught something on our thermal imager that I can't say we saw a dog man or a werewolf. All I can say is, is that we saw something on the thermal imager that matches the witness descriptions of what people have experienced in there. Wild. About a six It was foot living. It was giving off extreme heat because yeah. this was a this is June. This is the summer solstice. So it's very, very hot. And so whatever this was, we had it on black hot on the um, thermal imaging tool, but it, it was super dark. It was dark, but you could see like the ears, you could see the outline of like a snout, yeah. you can see an eye and there's two separate images that we got and they're different. So it's not that the same image, it is this thing moves. Wow. Um, and so you have two different images of this creature and, and it's I didn't even insanely distinct. And I at the time, I didn't even associate that with the Dogman legend um, because I'm thinking like TV, like movie werewolf type thing. You know, uh -huh. and this thing had the defining feature on this was really large, oversized, pointed ears. If you'd put a gun to my head, I would have gone. I'm looking at a huge bat here at this point, just with these large, oversized, pointed ears. So, yeah. like, I walked away not knowing what we'd seen. And we reached out to Barton Nunley, who was, you know, pretty much the the king of, you know, the weird and that neck of the woods, that part of the country. Yeah. And I shared those with him and he goes, let me share some witness sketches with you that have never been made public before. Um, just people that he's spoken to over the years. And he starts sending me these sketches and the defining feature on all of those sketches were those these big ears. oversized, large pointed ears at that point. And I'm going well, what the hell, man? I mean, we're, we're, I'm seeing something alive on this thermal imager that matches up with these witness descriptions. And that's when it really kind of became like real for us. And it's, it's still odd to even say that, you know what I'm saying? Because I understand how ridiculous that topic <laughs> is. Um, even more so than Bigfoot, yeah. that dogman topic, it's, it's kind of defined by its more ridiculous public facing kind of like stories with it, you know? 
Um, you don't see a lot of serious people out involved in like dogman research. No. <laughs> right? there's, just <laughs> a hand, there's just a handful across the country that are yep. doing it. Yeah. But um, that kind of became real for us. And then when the. Which the, is very unfortunate because it went from this is this is kind of a lark. This is kind of like, OK, this is there's no way this can be real to. You. Oh, God. Oh, no, this is real. Yeah. So, oh, God, this is real. So we have to pursue this now. And unfortunately. It's, it's it's weird because, like I said, we had we had that. We we're talking to all these witnesses. We found some strange tracks. And then the you know, that New York Times UAP article is out, you know, making the waves where they start talking about, you know, the the government efforts to look into the UAP phenomenon. And then all the stuff about Skinwalker Ranch starts coming out. And then, you know, uh, more and more stuff comes out, more stuff's released through Freedom of Information Act requests and buried in these UA UAP reports of people looking into UAP activity is reports of government scientists, people that were contracted by the government to look into this stuff. And they're having experiences with these upright canines as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you're nice. looking at this and it's, it, it's some of these like big names. It's, you know, Colm Keller, it's, it's, it's Luis Elizondo. I mean, they all talk about it. If you watch interviews with them, they get a little uncomfortable whenever it's brought up. Yeah. They, they get kind of cagey because it's, it's huh. pretty out there. Yeah. yeah they'll yeah. just, they'll just go, they always refer to it as things that go bump in the night, but they'll go, there's some things that go bump in the night that are, that are real. And, but it's buried in these reports. It's, they yeah. talk about how they were out looking for, reports of upright wolves and they were finding tracks they were there's supposedly like surveillance footage that exists out there that's not been made public um people have talked about how the phenomenon has followed them home but they, so and it's weird because again everybody kind of associates this phenomenon with the crazier elements that are that are online i don't know what it is i don't think anybody knows what it is it i may not even be a physical a completely physical phenomenon but there's something there to it and it's just it's kind of hard to sift through fact and fiction with it because like i said so much of well, what's online is just is just crazy fiction at with it. this but, point i yeah. mean like at this point the when it comes to bigfoot versus this dogman thing it seems like there is more evidence for the existence of dogman to us than bigfoot at least to us at this point i've never because seen, now you have official government documents yeah. acknowledging the existence or possible existence of these things being out there you have people with high level security clearances who are telling these stories who have been witnesses to this this isn't your run-of-the-mill crazy outside the gas station that's just rambling about a dogman these are people with high level security clearances these are trusted people and these are in the reports these upright canine sightings are in the reports they're there they're not they're not seeing bigfoot out there um these are official documents that have these reports in them and even for us it's it's weird to say but like i said i i whatever that was that i saw that matched the witness descriptions of dogman and the lbl i it, it wasn't it wasn't blurry vision i didn't see like a shape in the leaves and kind of you know I, I saw a outline and body heat. It was a living creature yeah. that I saw. And we've tried to debunk it. I mean, it's not a coyote. It's not a bear. It's not a deer. Um, we started getting really crazy with it. And I'm going, what else has big pointed ears? Is there like anything that would have kangaroos nearby? Did a kangaroo get out? I mean, that's the point where we were doing it. And we can't find any way to debunk it. Um, so I don't know what it is, but I've never seen I've never seen Sasquatch on a thermal imager before. But I saw whatever is in the lbl yeah has a snout and oversized pointed ears that's that's about six feet to six feet two I, i've seen that so wow. for me <laughs> for me it's realer than than i guess sasquatch is at this point yeah. and it's yeah. and that's odd to say again because i after after heaping so much scorn upon the topic for so many years like i did it's 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 kind of a rude awakening to kind of go oh god <laughs> and then, well, then you but then you go well if this is real then what else have i previously kind of dismissed yeah. that's real as well so yeah. so we've really opened our minds we've really opened our minds over the past i cup couple of years now mm -hmm. i think that really opened opened up our minds that that cracked them open because now we are we're, we get kind of out there with our discussions we do a live stream every monday at 7 30 p.m on our channel and we get out there with some of our discussions, but it we we discuss these theories and ideas. But it, I think you just have to be as open minded as possible at this point, because 
it seems like the truth is just stranger than fiction, you know, that the possibilities are completely endless of what these phenomenon are, what they what, what their origins are, uh, what they're doing, what their motivations are, what they are at all. So it's just um, it's it's crazy. It's like you take it already convoluted, complex subject, and now it's even more complex. I would love if the Sasquatch phenomenon I would love if it was just a monkey in the woods. I think that would be wonderful because that would be simple. You know what I'm saying? But this is so much more complex than that. And unfortunately, it's just going to get more and more complex the more we learn about it. Yeah, for sure. Do you think that um, geography plays a role into like where these hotspots are like LBL land between lakes is in like the western part of Kentucky? And, you know, the Appalachian Mountains have all these cave systems and stuff. Do you think that's, you know, where when people are, are going out to look for these things, you know, are, are if you take out a map, do you think you could pinpoint a lot of these spots just by kind of looking at the, the geography and, and, and all that? Yes and no, to a certain extent. Um so we talked earlier about like how those like Bigfoot tropes that you hear about that just are just repeated over and over again to everybody takes them just as is the gospel truth. Some of this other stuff is, I mean, you hear about the stuff about like large, you know, concentrations of granite um, and quartz, any sort of like liminal areas. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why the LBL is so weird. A, Kentucky itself is bizarre. Yeah. I mean, yes. I always tell people that Kentucky is almost like a state-sized skinwalker ranch with just all the weird stuff that's going on. They, out and there. they're like one of the only areas that have a high concentration of uh werewolf folklore and and insanely high concentration yeah. of that sort of stuff. I mean, yeah. again, I just I'd kind of glossed over it because that's that's not where my interests lie. But then we started getting into this, and I'm going, it's like every 10 miles, there's like a different like werewolf they're the wadi werewolf barilla yeah. um the gateway werewolf uh the red river gorge werewolf it's like every, there's just these where the beast of stories. lbl that's an obvious yeah, thing. That yeah. stretch back for decades and i'm going what is going on here because you don't see that anywhere else in the country yeah um and then those other like liminal area kind of hallmarks like around the the lbl is just packed with cemeteries there seems like there's an ever there's a different cemetery like every quarter mile in there there's also the human tragedy element of lbl and you know you could look at you can look at the geography of a place and say okay you got cave systems you got this or that um the lbl you also have these areas that are charged by human activity that there is a certain um misery or energy that kind of soaks into the earth below your feet, the LBL, you know, the, the, all those people were taken off of that land. It was the site of many battles. Uh, and it, it was, it the French and Indian war? Yeah. Just, it's been ever since there's been people in that neck of the woods, there has just been conflict. There's been conflict right there. It's yeah. the site of a, um, a, a civil war conflict. Um, you've got all those people that were living on the peninsula before it was a peninsula and when it was just the two rivers, all of those people got their land taken from them. Um, they were kicked off of that land and uh, there was no, there was nothing they could do. There were a lot of holdouts. There was some violent, violent holdouts at the end there, but the TVA took that land from those people. They dug up their cemeteries, moved these bodies. Sometimes they didn't even put the headstone with the body or with the right body. Sometimes they just left them there and then flooded over it. Wow. Um, so you've got the desecration of the dead there. You've got the iron industry of Kentucky was kind of saddled there in the mid 1800s. And um, one of the iron furnaces there was run by uh, slave labor. And there was a very violent slave revolt there. So you've just got all of these elements kind of working together to really put like a dark stain on the land. And then the, the geographic stuff, you've got massive cave system through there. Um, Mammoth cave system is yeah. just massive. And it's all over that part of Kentucky. There's a lot of mining and quarrying that has gone on there ever since that area has been settled. Um, water. So you've got all those like supernatural kind of hallmarks that take place through there. But my, my thing is, is when I said that you, you kind of yes and kind of no, we get a big chunk of our reports from areas that you just go there and you look and you go, how is this possible? I mean, the lady that Jesse was referring to that something was trying to get into her house. Um, her dad actually got in touch with us because she didn't know what to do. And he just kind of stumbled across us online. 
And they don't even have the, the, the terminology to kind of describe what's going on. They're just saying there's a monster trying to get into our house. Um, they thought at first it was trying to get to their dog. They were keeping their dog inside and this thing was trying to get into their dog, they thought. And they thought it was marking its territory around their house. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know if it was like, in a, like a, a feral dog, like a koi wolf, something like that, until they saw it. It was on two legs. They saw this two leg upright werewolf looking thing. We go there to look at it and I'm going, this isn't like a really densely populated metro area, but it's a neighborhood. It butts up to a um, wooded area, but it was kind of a neighborhood. Yeah. And it's um, not a very large wooded area. And yeah. I'm going, how is something that size getting in and out of here? And I'm looking at it and I'm just going, there's just no way this is possible. But then you talk to other people up there. Other people up there were experiencing not quite that severe of activity, but they were experiencing stuff as well with the same description for these things. Yeah. Um, and then you ask them, hey, do you know the lady like, you know, four streets over? I have no clue who that is, you know. So they don't know each other, but the very similar stories. But you look at it and you're just going, this makes no sense at all. So. For us, it's yeah, there's those areas that you can look at that you that it doesn't surprise you that they're hot spots. But then a lot of these little one off incidents that happen, they happen in areas where you just look at it and you just go, this makes a strange topic are that much stranger. Yeah. Because I can't see how any sort of thing is going on here. Like right now, it's just it's too it's too civilized, I guess. So but as far as like geography goes, especially in, and again, we focus on the Southern Appalachians, mostly into the mid Appalachian range, but it's, um, it's generally, it's these more, it's, it's the lesser populated areas, the areas that are a little bit more remote. And if, if, and it's so weird because this is where people are experiencing like Bigfoot, Dogman, you know, mysterious things that are coming out of the woods, like terrorizing them. But then you look back at some of the old like UFO researchers that went on, like John Keel. He talks about how a lot of the UFO activity would happen in sparsely populated rural areas at weird times of the night. He's like, it's happening almost like where it wants to be seen, but just by not that many people. And the same thing with the stuff that, that people are experiencing through this region of the country right now. Um, it's it's happening, but it generally it seems like it's happening for the most part in areas that are like not quite as heavily populated um, it's again, it's, it's, and that's a perfect description. It wants to be seen, but just not by that many people at this point. So. Yeah. It's a little, little, little choosy on <laughs> how many people exactly. get, get to experience it. Um, selective exposure. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, do you guys have advice for anyone who, who wants to get it into something like this, get on the ground investigating? Uh, Safety first, kind yeah. of know your limits. We always, and one of the things that's like our pet peeve is, is that you see people who do this sort of stuff and they kind of want to act like they're in possession of this like hidden knowledge. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, um, this like elite adventurers club or something. Um, we always encourage people to get out there. And the more people we have looking into this sort of stuff, the, the more data we get, you know? And yeah. I think that's what really hampers a lot of this, phenomena being taken seriously there's just not a lot of people taking a serious look at it and presenting the information that they get to other people so but definitely know your limits yeah um, know know what you're capable of if you want to get out in the woods and do this kind of work start small um and just kind of work your way up don't expect everything to fall into place immediately um you can go and watch our first video and see how terrible it is compared to what i'm producing now but just getting started, that first step is the is the biggest thing in the world. It's the hardest thing is that first step of doing this, doing this kind of work. And you can start with minimal equipment and then just build from there. Um, but it's one day at a time and knowing your limits, getting proper training for safety's sake and that you're you're actually capable in the woods. I do suggest that. But it's the biggest hurdle is always just getting started. It's just get started and go do it. And then if you're if so say you're like going, okay, I want to go out and I want to research Bigfoot activity, you know. Um, one of the things that really served us well was not relying upon like the classic cases, I guess I would say, is that we would really try to find an area that maybe there's a history of activity there, maybe not, but try to look for somewhere that has current activity. Um, and how do you go about doing that? You you don't get on. Well, a lot of people will try to get on to Facebook Bigfoot groups or, or BFRO stuff like that. Reports. Yeah. And it's it's 
I, there's some value in that, but at, at this point, I mean, I, we rarely even glance at anything on Facebook nowadays, as far as like cryptid groups or anything. It's just the, the noise to signal ratio is just out of whack, yeah, you know, for sure. but what we do is, is we will often start combing other like discussion boards or, or forums or anything like that, that are involved with outdoor activities, but they're not involved with like cryptid or the paranormal or anything like that. Like, Hiking forums, overlanding, fly uh, fishing, yeah, fishing, uh, hunters, uh, geocaching, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then, no matter which of those message boards you go into, there's always going to be that one thread that goes, "Have you ever seen anything weird in the woods?" You know, and then yeah. people start telling their stories. And again, these are people that spend a lot of time outdoors, um, and they're not into the subject of like cryptozoology or the paranormal. So we start looking for stuff like that. We start looking for areas. One of the areas that we found, um, the guy was a rock climber. He did a lot of like rock climbing. And while he was exploring part of the mountains through here to find an area to rock climb, he had a extremely close Bigfoot sighting. Yeah. Right and there. then as he kind of got that area mapped out for rock climbing, people that showed up later on to rock climb were having those same sightings. They were talking about them online. Interesting. So that never made its way into like a Facebook Bigfoot group. It was never in a book of Bigfoot stories, but we happened to come across it on a message board and followed up. And yeah, there seems like there's activity through there. So look for those non-traditional kind of sources, sources for information. Uh, when we were doing the LBL research, because everybody knows about the, the 1982 attack and all the, the famous stories, I would go through on some of the local newspapers there online and just look for stories about places through there. Um, it could be anything like they would have maybe a story about a particular cove or um, anything at all. And then you start looking through the comments of it and people invariably you'll find somebody going, you know, I was there one night and I heard the strangest howl. And then somebody else will go in and go, oh, my Lord, I was there like, you know, six months ago. We saw something big and upright running by on the shoreline where we were there on our boat. So we look for those kind of non like those less sensational, but credible, you know, very credible. Um, they don't even really posit what they saw. Yeah. But we look for stuff like that. And then we try to hone in on those areas to see to see what's going on at this point. Um if you're wanting to try to document it, if you're going to try to document what you see so that you have something more than just a campfire story to share at this point, um, it's it's a little daunting. It's a little overwhelming at first. Um, kind of know what your goals are. Uh, it, it's And then know how to work the equipment. That's one yeah. of my, my pet peeves with this stuff is that you'll see people um, and they'll have this very expensive gear and they don't really they don't really know how to use it. They just know that it, it's bright. It makes some cool colors. It makes some cool noises and it looks good on camera. So that's what we're going to use. It and they get reading said, you're like, what does that mean? I don't know. Okay. So <laughs> it's, it's something. <laughs> so if you're, if you're going to use it, if you're going to waste the money on something that you on, because at the end of the day, this is, this is a weird pursuit. You know what I'm saying? You know, if you're going to, if you're going to spend your money on this sort of stuff, at least if you're going to spend it, kind of learn how to use it at that point. Uh, if you're going to take an EMF detector in the woods, know what it's telling you, know how to read it. Uh, like I said, we got that infrasound equipment right now. There's really no instruction manual on that as far as like cryptid research. So um, I'm out most nights trying to figure out what normal levels of infrasound looks like so that when we're out in the woods investigating, I'm not going to get excited about something that's mundane, you know, so know what normal looks like. So that way you can kind of figure out when something that you're experiencing is abnormal. But I do have a warning that what's happened to us is the level that we're at right now with the equipment and the research and the background and the training and everything that we do. This has pretty much taken over our lives. Um, we don't go on vacations. We don't um, we don't watch Netflix. Um, we don't go out like to the bar on the weekend. This has pretty much taken over our entire lives. So be forewarned if you want to do this to the, to like this level. It's going to take all of your time. It's a it's a demanding mistress. Sometimes, it is man. a very demanding um, thing because you have to basically Joe's basically getting like a degree in electrical engineering by you know, doing point. doing all this. And that's the cool part about it is, is that if you get involved in this sort of stuff and you get deep into it, uh, you know, like if we decided to walk away from all this tomorrow, 
just the education that we got. Yeah. Just, just weird, obscure things that, you know, that just a lot of people out there don't really know that much about. Uh, like I said, I, I, with the infrasound thing, I didn't know anything about bioacoustics or, or sound or anything like that before I started this. And now it's something that I read about pretty much every day, you know? Um, so it's just, you get such a weird, like little education on it, but, uh, but yeah, definitely. If you're, if you're wanting to get into this, it, it, the, the thing is, is that again, the safety aspect of it, kind of know what you're looking for, know how to use the equipment and then just, um, be prepared for the, the backlash <laughs> that you're going to get the, uh, the online, especially the online cryptid and paranormal communities are, it's like a, a shark tank out there, man. Oh, they you can know? get spicy for um, sure. <laughs> oh, it gets, it gets crazy. So, I mean, luckily we kind of, we kind of. But it's full of schizophrenic sharks. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so it, we, we kind of avoid a lot of that, but I don't care what you do. It's, it's going to offend somebody. And I guess yeah. just have thick skin. Don't let it bother you and just kind of. Because again, our thing is, is that I, I, for years, I was a Bigfoot researcher. I had a whole network of other Bigfoot researchers that I kind of corresponded with across the country. And now I'm that weird dogman guy. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? So, I mean, that was kind of hard to deal with that people that, you know, you used to have a really good relationship with and there was mutual respect now just kind of dismiss you. And you're going, well, I mean, and I see and experiencing that firsthand, I realize why some of this stuff is kind of relegated to the fringe, even in kind of a weird community, because even if you have that sort of experience that maybe goes outside those really narrowly defined parameters of, of what a Bigfoot is, you're not going to tell anybody in your like little community because you're just going to get, you know, you would think that these would be open-minded people because of the subject matter they're all united by. And that's not the case at all. So, yeah. so if you're going to be in this and you're going to follow where that data takes you and you're going to follow where the experiences take you, realize that sometimes it takes you in kind of a, an uncomfortable direction and you've got a decision to make at that point. Am I just going to ignore certain data? So I can stay in the respectable parameters of something that's accepted, like Bigfoot research or whatnot. Or am I just going to go where it takes me to, you know? And I have the fortitude to be uh, truthful and steadfast in your pursuit. Um, just have the personal fortitude to be able to do that. And just just go at it, be truthful and just just barrel through. If you're able to do that, you can you can get really far in finding some kind of data, some kind of answers to what's going on. If you don't allow outside forces to really uh, hamper your work. Because I we hear it all the time. People will go, that's crazy. I go, you're telling me it's crazy. I'm yeah. just, I understand that. I was there and I experienced it. It's crazy. What is it? I have no earthly idea. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we saw, I, we, we saw something in the area that we've been researching lately and we don't even know how to describe it. We, or we saw a, this is crazy sounding, whether we saw a portal open up, whether we saw a UAP near the ground, we saw like an anomalous light that was about the size of a small car. Giving off extreme heat. Extreme heat. We picked it up on the thermal imager. It was bright, but it didn't illuminate anything around it. Mm -hmm. And if you want to throw Strange. another element of weirdness on it, I saw what looked like figures along the bottom of it. It's crazy. And we got footage of this. It's yeah, we in, got footage. Of yeah, we have a so. video out. It's called a burning light and we have footage of it. I have it on the I got it with the full spectrum camera. And I also had the thank goodness I had the the presence of mind to grab my thermal and get a thermal video of it as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's very strange. It's very it's uh, it's we I don't even know how to process. Yeah, we don't even know how to describe <laughs> what happened to us, but we we were filming. It. We've got footage of it and yeah. we experienced it. And when we present it to people, they're just because it's an unknown. And I think that's the thing is that people, you, you know, mankind, they want everything defined. I mean, we have little devices in our pockets that you have the sum of human information at your fingertips. People kind of like a mystery, but they want their, you know, they want their mysteries very easily, you know, very clearly defined. Back to point. that boggle threshold. <laughs> so, and I'm just going, I don't know what it was, you know? Well, you know, could it have been this? I don't know, man. I don't have a, a that's never happened to us before. We weren't even really, you know, we weren't looking for anything like that. We just happened to stumble across this thing in the woods and, you know, and it. Well, did you go towards it? No, we didn't go towards it. I mean, yeah, I tried, we got out of there, you know. <laughs> um, we weren't prepared for that. We didn't have most of our equipment with us. I'm seeing what looks like figures. And then it starts rising up into the air a little bit. I'm like, we need to get out of here. You know, well, you should have gone towards it. No, man, you go towards it. You know, <laughs> I mean, 
So it's it it takes you in some weird areas. And yeah, I we looked at that footage when we got home, and I'm like, I almost don't even want to release this because this is just going to open up such a can of worms for us at this point, you know. And it has yeah. to a certain degree, but at the end of the day, it happened, and we've got oh, well. the footage to back it up. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's yeah. Again, we're not gonna we're not gonna censor what we we report. We're just gonna like kind of report what happened to us, and they just let the chips fall where they may. Yeah. So. Exactly. Exactly. Well, listen, guys, this has been a fascinating conversation. I would love to. Uh, listen to you guys all night, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but we're definitely, we're definitely, uh, uh, going, going at time here. So I'm just going to ask you guys to uh, let my listeners know, uh, where they can find your stuff online, how they can follow you and, and check out all of your, your stuff. We have a YouTube channel. It's called Hellbent Holler. Uh, you can just look up for that on YouTube and you can watch all of our videos uh, that we've gotten over the past two and a half, three years. Uh, we do a live stream every Monday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern where we get on there and we basically sit there. We have we have some of the coolest uh, viewers. We have some of the coolest, most insightful, thoughtful people that view our content and interact with us. So we do a interactive live stream every Monday. If you want to join us for that, just come over to the channel. It's a lot of fun. Um, and you can find me on Instagram at Hellbent Jesse. And I post over there sometimes, but yeah, we're going to be updating the YouTube channel on a regular basis. And, uh, we've, we've been working on a series that's coming out. I've got stuff in the, in the can right now. Um, I've got Brown mountain lights, uh, footage that I'm going to be releasing. And then after that, we'll be releasing some of our stuff from our last trip to the LBL. So that's going to be coming out soon as well. And you can always go to youtube.com slash hellbent holler to view those. Right on. Thank you guys so much. And uh, yeah, thank you. Hey, thank right. you. Thanks again to Jesse and Joe for coming onto the show. That was an absolute fire hose of really awesome information. So if any of you listening out there ever want to get into a similar thing where you're going in boots on the ground, investigating into the woods and areas of high strangeness, definitely heed their advice, safety first, and know when it's time to bounce from a situation for sure. Make sure to check out and subscribe to their YouTube channel and give them a follow on their socials. Those links will be in the show notes. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the show today. Thanks for hanging out with me and giving it a listen. As always, a huge thank you to everyone out there who checks out my show. Again, people who download it, share it with friends and family. It helps me out so much when you do that. The Strangeology podcast would not be possible without the support of listeners like you. And if you're looking for a way to support the show and what I'm doing here, you can check out my Patreon, which you can join for as little as $1 a month. I've got a number of tiers with increasing benefits like shout outs, early access to episodes, along with access to ad free episodes and the Strangeology Beyond episode extension, which can sometimes be a whole episode in and of itself. You can also get merch discounts, exclusive merch, voting power for topics to cover. There's even a t-shirt club of the month and a lot more. And speaking of shout outs today, we've got Alex, Alyssa, Chad from Appalachian Huntsman, Mike Waddell from MetaZoo Games, Greg from All the Weird, Miranda, John, Prepared Wolf, Cassie, Maureen, Gail, Adam F, Ryan, Anne, Angie, Adam J, Daniel from Blue Room Insight, Jeremiah from The Bigfoot Society, Easton Hawk, Guy, Megan, Jeff from Map and Black, Jason, Into the Wildwood, Miguel, Albert, Nicole, Shane from Inquiries of Our Reality, Lene, Jeffer, Carlos M, Richie, Carlos B, Robin Hood, and Son of the Wolf. You all rock and thank you for your continued support, which helps keep the lights on here at Strangeology. Thank you all so much. And if you want to join this ever-growing community of fellow lovers of the weird and unexplained, you can check it out 
at patreon.com forward slash strangeology. Again, that's patreon.com forward slash strangeology. To any advertisers or companies out there looking to collaborate with the Strangeology podcast, or if you're someone who would like to be considered for an interview on the show, please send all business inquiries to info at strangeology.com. And if you haven't yet, make sure to give me a follow over on all my social media accounts. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and TikTok. I'm most active posting short form content on Instagram and TikTok. So if you're looking for more from Strangeology, definitely check that out. I also have exclusive videos to my YouTube channel. And this year I am making an attempt to add some more video content up there as well. And if you're looking for another way to support the show, you can check out my Etsy shop at strangeology.etsy.com where I've got an assortment of cryptid, alien, and Fordian gear available on t-shirts, hoodies, long sleeves, and tank tops, which, hey, warmer weather is coming, so you gotta rock some cryptid tanks when it's hot out for sure. There's also stickers, magnets, prints, mugs, enamel pins, and more. And I've got a few new design ideas in the works as I have free time to actually work on them. So stay tuned. I'm always trying to add new things and also spread out designs to different products as well. So again, that's strangeology.etsy.com. Check it out. All right. I think that's all from me for now. I'm going to take a quick break here. Jesse and Joe were able to stick around for quite a while longer to chat about some more harrowing stories and encounters with high strangeness and occult activity in southern appalachia so you won't want to miss it patrons stick with me and for everyone else until next time take care of yourselves and each other and keep it strange Welcome back, members, for Strangeology Beyond. And thanks again, Jesse and Joe, for coming on the show tonight.